Good morning or afternoon. My name is Janie Montblanc, and on behalf of the Great Basin Fire Science Exchange team and our partners, I would like to welcome you to this webinar titled Weather Variability and Forecasting Tools for Short and Long-Term Restoration Planning, presented by Stuart Hardegree, plant physiologist with the USDA Agricultural Research Service. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to let you know that you may ask questions of the speaker or me at any time during the webinar by typing your questions into the questions pane of your control panel located at the top right of your screen. I will keep questions for the presenter in the queue and field them after the presentation. I also want to let you know that whatever you do in your control panel does not affect the webinar presentation, so you are welcome to type a test message or test your audio at any time during the webinar. If you're having problems with your audio, please open your audio pane and check your audio selections. Now I would like to introduce our presenter. Dr. Stuart Hardegree is a plant physiologist with the USDA ARS Research Service, oh sorry, Agricultural Research Service, um, Northwed, Northwest Watershed Research Center in Boise, Idaho. His research includes physiological ecology of rangeland species, plant and soil water relations, plant establishment, and rehabilitation of disturbed lands. He is currently developing a database of rangeland weather and seeding information to aid in adaptive management planning by public and private land managers. Welcome, Stuart, and thank you for being here today. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, thanks for attending this webinar. Today I'll be talking about weather-centric restoration planning. Uh, this talk will mostly focus on intermountain shrub steppe plant communities that have been disturbed by wildfire and annual grass invasion, but I think the general principles are applicable to many other systems. The key point of my talk is that we need to acknowledge the extremely high annual and seasonal variability in weather on these rangelands and adopt planning strategies that can accommodate and compensate for this variability. The subtext for my talk is that prescriptive management in the absence of a weather context is inefficient and we need a much longer planning horizon and more flexible management options uh, to achieve our restoration goals. Western rangelands are highly variable at all temporal scales. When we describe the climate of a given area, we're typically looking at long-term averages in annual precipitation and temperature. Uh, this is a slide I've used many times before, the long-term precipitation record for Boise, Idaho. And you can see the high variability in annual rainfall in year to year from these red uh, bars. Uh, this variability, however, is, is just exacerbated when you consider shorter time scales that may relate to critical periods for plant establishment. The lower bars here represent spring precipitation during these same years, and this variability is about twice the variability you see in, in annual precipitation. I've highlighted four years here that have average or above average annual precipitation, but still have very below average precipitation during a critical spring establishment period. At even shorter time scales, this variability is higher this is the May precipitation during that same period. And May variability is about twice the variability of spring variability. Uh, May is pretty critical in this particular area uh, as winter rainfall stops dropping, the temperatures start rising. Uh, in these highlighted years, a significant drought in May may, may be a key limiting factor for seedling growth, uh, where these seedlings really need to uh, keep root growth down where they can capture water from lower in the solar soil profile because near the surface it's, it's getting really dry. Long-term weather averages uh, define the climate and they're mostly used for things like selection of suitable plant materials. Uh, planting guides and maps like this are mostly describe site suitability for persistence of mature plant communities in the absence of disturbance. Unfortunately, the microclimatic requirements for early plant establishment are much more restrictive than the long-term climatological needs of mature plant communities. 
And in the past, these plant communities may have had the luxury of surviving bad establishment years in the absence of introduced annual weeds and under a natural fire cycle. But these days, opportunistic weedy species have both increased the frequency of disturbance and can establish and reproduce more quickly than our perennial grasses and shrubs. Microclimate is what the plants see, and this can add another layer of variability that complicates plant establishment. Uh, microclimate is affected by all of the incoming weather parameters, which are variable enough, but seedbed microclimate is also affected by soil type and texture, which determines the available water capacity and the hydraulic conductivity of the soil to the seeds and establishing seedlings. And this, uh, my, this soil variability is very uh, is highly variable over space, especially in areas of complex terrain where topographic effects on soil formation can produce soils with very different texture and depth over very short distances. Microclimate is also affected by the presence of these very weeds that are competing with our desirable species. They use up available water, change nutrient cycles, and under stress can just set seed and wait out unfavorable drought periods. This is just a plot of seasonal water used by cheatgrass, uh, the lower dots versus uh, water availability in the profile under bare ground. Microclimate is also affected by the type of seedbed preparation treatments that we use in restoration. Uh, the goal here is usually to place the seeds at a depth where they can be buffered from drought and heat stress near the surface but still have enough energy to emerge. Uh, most of these treatments are prescriptive in that they're designed to improve seedbed microclimate in general for the seed, but in a bad year, microclimatic optimization is perhaps irrelevant, and in really good years, uh, the effect of microclimatic optimization is probably less important. When you consider the life cycle of the plant, the seed phase is relatively immune to weather. Uh, we've been finding that germination per se isn't usually a limiting factor in most situations. If conditions are extremely bad, the seeds can just sit there and wait. Uh, in most years, non-dormant seeds are going to germinate well enough uh, sometime during the year, but once germinated, become extremely vulnerable to relatively short-term microclimatic events of freezing and drought. And, and the major bottleneck to these early phases of plant establishment may be between germination and emergence, uh, where newly germinated seeds experience relatively short-term mortality events. That climatological classification that I mentioned earlier mostly pertains to this adult community uh, life stage, um, and not so much to these others, except for the, the seed phase all of these other life stages can pretty much be terminated by adverse weather or extreme weather variability. These days, uh, restoration planning, planning generally acknowledges variability in space and time, and in particular acknowledges the dynamics of plant community change through the process of succession. Uh, this is just the conceptual model from the ARS ecologically based invasive plant management program. Uh, in addition to focusing on underlying ecological processes driving succession, models like this also deal with general uncertainty through iterative planning and adaptive management. So in a successional restoration program, uh, planning identifies site-specific ecological processes that may need to be addressed for successful restoration and identifies suitable tools to facilitate vegetation change in a desirable trajectory. I've listed some of these. All of these can be torpedoed, however, by uncooperative weather. Historically, we've used weather information only in retrospective analysis and mostly to understand uh, failure uh, what we're really struggling with now is the question of whether we can embrace the reality of weather variability and incorporate weather knowledge into more effective restoration strategies on western rangelands. The predominant mechanism for restoration intervention on western rangelands is really the 
current burned area emergency response program on federal land. Uh, when a wildfire occurs, a planning team is sent out relatively quickly and is asked to come up with a stabilization and rehabilitation plan within a very short time frame, usually just a couple of weeks. Uh, this program has an advantage over federal non-emergency restoration planning in that after a fire, certain management actions are pre-approved and don't require a relatively long or multi-year NEPA process to implement the plans. And these plans are usually implemented in the same year immediately following the fire, uh, but only in that year in most cases. Uh, the focus of this program is also stabilization and rehabilitation, not restoration. Uh, and implementation is pretty much removed from the more general restoration planning process uh, in areas that haven't burned. Under this scenario, the fire may put us back to what we would call square one, particularly if the area has burned several times and is dominated by annual weeds, but there are no available seed sources for natural recovery. Uh, in most years, this single event stabilization activity uh, is relatively unsuccessful in what we would call restoration uh, in a cheatgrass dominated area to anything near what we would consider a desirable state. If, however, the burned area is in a more favorable environment in general, perhaps higher elevation, higher precipitation, lower initial weeds, and the weather cooperates, there might be general success that persists for several years. Another fire, however, can remove the success and the probability of recurrent fire increases over time. More typical scenario, however, isn't uh, initial success, it's partial success. In any given year, for whatever reason, uh, and it may favor establishment of certain species over others, which is probably better than nothing, but is usually not fulfilling uh, restoration goals for diverse plant communities. These systems also that are partially successful generally have more significant annual weed problems in, in uh, what has not established that you planted and can be expected to revert to square one after even just an additional wildfire. Uh, regardless, the overriding determinant of establishment success in these cases is weather. And given the single event nature of, of management treatments for fire rehab and uh, initially, the low probabilities of initial success or partial success uh, and low, low success is exacerbated by leaving the system in a vulnerable state with no follow-up management to maintain a positive restoration trajectory in the longer term. Uh, David Pilly gave a very interesting presentation at the Great Basin Consortium meeting a few months ago where he analyzed the historical weather patterns relative to fire rehab treatments in the Great Basin and found that the same dry weather that resulted in a heavy fire year seems to persist in the following year when rehabilitation is attempted. So in this case, it's even worse uh, for fire rehabilitation scenarios and looks more like this. Actual restoration planning, which we could define as management in non-fire years, is pretty much the same scenario as fire rehabilitation, except that maybe you aren't always starting your treatments in such a bad precipitation year. Uh, but the major problem with current implementation of NEPA planning is the single year orientation that requires one to predict the impacts of alternative management treatments after single year management events in the absence of a, a weather and climate context. So our current paradigm for restoration planning, even in non-fire years, is maybe only marginally better than our initial expectations for success uh, because there is maybe a higher expectation for precip in the initial management year. Uh, and also the greater likelihood that other restoration resources may be more generally available in a non-fire year. Often in a big fire year, planning is less relevant given the scarcity of seeds and the need to parse limited resources over very large areas. How do we deal with uncertainty normally? People have thought a lot about this most effective way to deal with uncertainty uh, by adopting an adaptive management approach. The Department of Interior has released some very useful guidance in this area and the literature on the subject has been increasing uh, 
exponentially in the last 10 years. Uh, adaptive management guidance acknowledges uncertainty and offers several strategies to deal with this uncertainty. I'll talk about two aspects here of adaptive management, learning while doing and adaptive iteration. The traditional model for learning while doing suggests that there may be alternative options that will be more effective and that we should test multiple options when we manage to continuously improve our understanding of the system and over time end up with a more effective suite of management options. Uh, in this scenario, we test multiple options, evaluate their success, and in the future, uh, focus on the successful option. Uh, this generic scenario, once again, uh, will be significantly impacted by weather that derails its effectiveness. A weather variability and associated uncertainty applies to both success and failure. The historical literature is somewhat biased and the papers only get published when there's some kind of success to report. And we're a lot better at reporting weather conditions in the field these days, but historically, if weather information is reported at all, it notes that most of the historical literature was obtained from studies that occurred in above average precipitation years, or at least in years with above average precipitation during the establishment period. So learning while doing really needs to be interpreted in a weather-centric context. If an option is unsuccessful in a dry year, it shouldn't necessarily be abandoned uh, because most years on these rangelands are dry. Uh, if an option is successful in a very good year, maybe it needs to be reassessed in other years to determine whether it's useful when the weather isn't as fav favorable. We also need a mechanism to deal with the predominant management response, which is partial success rather than uh, total success. So the central option here on this slide is, is usually the most relevant. Uh, the DOI guidance on adaptive management allows for longer term planning scenarios or suggests them, but these scenarios haven't really been implemented currently in an EPA context. Uh, the model shown here for contingency adaptive management planning is consistent with the adaptive management philosophy of all of these succession-based restoration planning tools, but the major current barrier is to define how we can do contingency planning within a NEPA framework when we basically don't know what the site conditions are going to be after our initial intervention and can't say for sure what type of future intervention will be necessary. I think we already have a process for making these decisions through adaptive management and contingency uh, succession planning, but we just need to get approval or some mechanism to get approval for longer term uh, planning uh, through the NEPA process for certain future conditions that give us some flexibility with future management to keep a positive trajectory going towards our restoration goals without having to stop and get reapproval uh, every time we consider an alternative uh, management option. The most obvious way to use weather, however, is to have prior weather knowledge through for forecasting. Short-term forecasting from the Weather Service is based on fiscal models of atmospheric processes and only really goes out a couple of weeks, and we all know uh, the level of uncertainty even in that short-term forecast. At the other end of the spectrum, however, the kind of models that we use for predicting uh, climate change scenarios 100 years down the road or those same models which are used for seasonal forecasts three, six, or nine months down the road. Uh, there are all kinds of models for these longer-term forecasts, but in the past, uh, the emphasis has really been on forecasts for fairly broad regions, if not the entire Earth, and the process that has been used to run multiple models, uh, and the procedure has been to run multiple models and then look at average predictions. And this results in fairly, fairly crude predictions that are only valid over large spaces. It turns out, however, that all the models used in the current ensemble forecast have different assumptions and different relative effectiveness, depending upon where you want your forecast, what time of year you need to make your forecast, and how far out you need to make your forecast. Uh, these models are currently being tested individually over the entire U.S. using historical weather records 
to do what's called hind casting of models for previous years. Uh, they run the forecast models for the last 30 years and compare it to the historical weather record. Uh, in general, temperature is always a more robust prediction than precipitation. For someone out of luck in the Great Basin where precipitation prediction and seasonal forecast is generally poor, but there are plenty of areas where these predictions are better. Now, this doesn't mean that precipitation forecasts are useless in the Great Basin. In many intermountain areas, we might only have a good restoration year one in five years. And in that case, the question isn't how good are these predictions in general, but whether they're still valid in those good years where there's an extremely strong signal for higher than average precipitation. We also know that for seeds planted in the fall, there's usually adequate precipitation, at least for germination to occur sometime during the fall or winter. And the bigger issue is usually predicting post-germination mortality, which can be linked to favorable thermal periods in the winter when water is not limiting, followed by harsh temperatures that kill pre-emergent seedlings. So this uh, temperature prediction actually might be very useful in uh, predicting post post-germination mortality. We're just starting to address these issues, but the best we'll be able to come up anyway are, are probabilistic assessments of what a given year might be. Uh, usually with these forecasts, you get a probability of exceedance from historical averages, and these probabilities still need to be disaggregated into actual weather scenarios uh, that allow you to model uh, different trends. Uh, knowing these probabilities will undoubtedly improve the cost efficiency of restoration uh, by giving us a better chance of, of acting when things are positive or not acting when things are negative. But they won't really change the underlying variability in weather or the need to have longer term contingency plans to maintain a successful trajectory along a time series that is going to include both good and bad weather in Given even a probabilistic forecast, the, the choices that we might make for restoration in a given year will still be dependent on whether it's a post-fire rehabilitation decision or a restoration planning decision in the absence of fire. Most uh, restoration activities occur in the fall in the Great Basin. If soil stabilization after fire is the primary objective, then the choices may be whether to even control weeds in that year as they still provide some cover even in a, a bad restoration year or perhaps the decision will be whether or not to waste money on expensive native plant materials in a year where there's very little chance of establishment. Now, there may be more options for restoration planning in a non-fire year as you always have the option of doing nothing if, if your prediction is a bad establishment year and then just waiting for a better year. Uh, in the meantime, as we wait for online and instantly available forecast tools, what do we do? We can still pull up weather records. We can still put our field sites in the context of historical variability. And this is useful both for retrospective analysis, which we, we are now doing through resources like the Landry Digital Library, and in interpretation of individual management actions, if you're actively managing and using uh, adaptive management and testing out alternatives. Weather records are on the one hand very available but on the other hand somewhat uh, hard to access but they are online from a large number of sources. Uh, detailed weather information is still mostly available along transportation corridors and at airports but if you're just interested in daily precipitation and temperature that kind of data is more widely available. Uh, the Weather Service all has, also has a network of stations in the U.S. that undergo a much more rigorous uh, data checking procedure uh, because they're contributed to these global modeling activities. Almost every state also has its own network in support of local agriculture. Uh, in southern Idaho, it's the Agrimet network, uh, which goes all across the Snake River Plain. Uh, some organizations, the Western Regional Climate Center coordinates technology transfer for some of these data, but it's always useful to look at weather data that is associated with the sites near your field locations. There are a number of sources now for gridded or modeled weather data that can give you information, particularly in areas where there aren't any 
weather stations. Uh, one that's been around for a long time is PRISM, uh, which used to just be monthly averages, uh, but relatively recently has added some daily weather products that can be used for retrospective analysis. Um, there's a tool out there called Daymet that's been around for a while. It, it uses models to uh, interpolate between weather stations but incorporating topographic effects on weather patterns and uh, this might be more accurate, a more accurate way to get weather information in complex terrain. Uh, the Daymet site, you just type in your location, the variables of interest, and you get a time series output in just a few minutes. It is always useful with these gridded data sets to check it against measured data, even if it's short-term measured data from a field site, because there are often uh, systematic biases in these data just based on assumptions for the interpolation. In my experience, the patterns are pretty good, but magnitudes can be systematically off sometimes, just a, a set amount. It may need correction uh, depending on how far you are from the underlying base station network on which this data set is based. Uh, Daymet has one kilometer resolution and, and has a lot more parameters than PRISM. Uh, the only one that's really lacking for most ecological models is uh, wind. Donna Boxglue up at the University of Idaho has a four kilometer gridded model product that's based on weather data and remote sensing and adjusted with climatological averages for different time periods. Uh, this product is four kilometer, four kilometer grid uh, and is available through the University of Idaho Knowledge Network and is updated at this point pretty much every week. So on the management horizon is one stop shopping for the full spectrum of weather products regardless of whether you're interested in historical or seasonal forecasts or climate change projections. Uh, it will include uh, historical measured and gridded data sets, user specified seasonal forecasts for real time management planning, and disaggregated weather scenarios for climate change projections. Our goal is to allow the user to just identify the location and the historical or future time frame of interest and be able to generate weather data on the fly that can be interpreted uh, for whatever your management purpose, whether it's restoration or crop production or, uh, or plant phenology or some agricultural application. Uh, initially, this is going to be in a wiki format where the tools are organized and instructions will be avail available so that everyone can use the tools that we're now using. Uh, but eventually the process will be webified so that all you have to know is the location and time period of interest and then you receive customized output for your application. So what are the general implications of weather-centric restoration planning? Uh, in order to take advantage of weather knowledge, we're really going to have to change our planning procedures, our management strategies, and our funding logistics single event NEPA assessments for single or single year fire recap planning is, has not been and isn't going to improve in effectiveness. We need much longer planning horizons and the ability to take future management actions based on ecological principles that can be applied to whatever unique situation occurs uh, along this trajectory rather than the current planning scenario that requires uh, future management effects to be predicted and defined up front. Emergency stabilization and rehabilitation is not restoration, but it's de facto restoration and an opportunity that could be leveraged for longer term management actions, uh, but it needs to be integrated in with a more general restoration scenario. Uh, all current information on restoration management is biased by weather and all previous and future research needs really need to be viewed within a weather context to make valid inferences. Uh, forecasting may relieve some of these planning issues, but it's still going to be a probabilistic exercise, and planning will still need to be contingency-based and long-term. As these two technologies develop, the biggest barrier is really going to be to figure out how we make the, the change and how we accept uh, 
a new paradigm for weather-centric management. That was my presentation. I'm way ahead of time, but I'll entertain any questions you have. Great. Thanks so much, Stuart. <clears throat> All right. If you have any questions, please type them into the questions pane of your control panel. And um, Matt or Francis, if you have questions, uh, I guess let me know in the chat box and I'll unmute your mics. Or I guess I could just unmute you right now. <clears throat> Well, that's great, Stuart. It looks like there were there are a lot of um, good tools, and it'll be nice um, to have them all in one spot in the near future. Uh, we're working with the uh, Northwest Climate Hub. Uh, Bill Moat, who's with the NOAA RISA, and John Box Blue at the University of Idaho, uh, the Northwest Knowledge Network, and the Climate Science Center in Corvallis. Um, we're actually using these restoration applications as a, a test case for some of these gridded general products, but we're hoping that we can interest people in all kinds of disciplines who need pretty much the same weather type inputs to their ecological models, whether it's water supply forecasting, uh, crop applications, uh, snow milk, uh, plant production or animal production. Uh, and we're hoping to work with them to design custom applications that they can use for their purposes. Uh, a lot of these weather climate tools are fairly generic from the user standpoint, and we want to make it as easy as possible uh, for people to work on their models, which they're an expert in, and not have to also be an expert in uh, weather and climate tools. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Matt asks, Stuart, has anyone tested how well the National Weather Service forecasts have performed at different weather stations? I'm curious if performance is better or worse for Wyoming Big Sagebrush ecological sites versus higher elevation sites. Uh, well, John Box Blue right now has two postdocs working on testing these individual models that go into the ensemble. The ensemble model that you get from the Climate Prediction Center is relatively crude anyway, and usually just has a big white spot in the Great Basin. Uh, what I've asked them to do is, is not just focus on the general utility. When they do skill forecasts, they use all the years in the forecast. Uh, I'm asking them to look more precisely at whether these very big years, the ones with the big signal either dry or wet, have any level of skill associated with them. Uh, pretty much, though, relative to all other areas, the intermountain uh, zone has very poor precipitation forecasts, but it still has pretty good uh, thermal forecasts. But hopefully they'll be able to, to tease out whether even in the Great Basin there's, there's utility in those years when you really uh, want to focus, say, your restoration efforts, or you maybe want to even avoid controlling weeds because nothing else is going to come up in soil stability. Stuart, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested in, you know, you talked about wind, and is anybody working on trying to get those types of models incorporated? Um, I mean, I've noticed with our common gardens, I think we, this year we had a, we might have had a pretty significant issue with, with uh, wind for one of our sites, and, and that may have had to do with the failure. Wind is not usually included in forecast models that mostly focus on temperature and precipitation, but in terms of retrospective analysis or modeling in real time for a field study, um, there are people that have done a lot of work with wind models, but it's mostly in the Great Plains states. Uh, and various crop models. I've been trying to get the people in Fort Collins who do that wind modeling to come out and see what kind of applications they could develop. Uh, if you're doing research in certain areas, there's relatively high quality wind information other than just what you can get from uh, local net sites. Uh, these NEXRAD these NEXRAD radar locations pretty much have to have line of sight. In, the western U.S., 
technically, if you just do this 230-kilometer circle about these radar stations, you'd be covering 96% of the U.S., but in the western U.S., the effective coverage is more like 30%. But if you're in an area where the next rat is hitting, like most of the Snake River Plain, uh, where a lot of us do research, uh, they have pretty much pretty good hourly wind estimates. And the reason the wind is so good is because there's a lot of particulates in the air regardless of conditions. And so the return signal for looking at direction and uh, velocity of wind is pretty robust. At this point, they actually uh, record those data and store them at the National Climate Data Center. Um, that, that could be a potentially really useful resource, at least for understanding what the wind scenario was at, at your field site. Uh, otherwise, uh, most of the weather information you get, if you just counted it all up, just includes daily min-max temperature and total precipitation. Um, and in particular, in complex terrain, it's kind of iffy to extrapolate uh, topographic effects on wind if you don't actually have uh, measurements. What we've been trying to do is the real typical scientific scenario is you're out in the field, you have your net station because you know weather's important, but your field study might only be two years long, one year long, three years long. But you can use these uh, grid products and at least compare your local records with uh, the gridded records. What we're suggesting to expand the inference of these relatively short-term field studies is to put your study in the context of the long-term variability so you can say whether those years were on the, the wet end or the dry end or the windy end or the, the hot end just to get a better sense of how strong your inferences may be for general conditions. Um, wind is one of those things, though, that isn't hugely correlated. If these gridded products have a bias in their precipitation estimate, it's usually a, a pretty constant bias, and you can get away with just uh, a single correction factor. But uh, wind is a little more problematic. Great, thanks so much. <clears throat> well, um, your presentation must have been very clear because we do not have any further questions from the attendees. Um, so yeah, I guess that's the last question. We would greatly appreciate it if you would take our three question survey of this webinar that will appear after the webinar has ended. A link to the recording of this webinar on the Great Basin Fire Science YouTube channel will be sent to you automatically through the GoToWebinar system tomorrow. Our next webinar in this series titled Climate, Weather, and Sagebrush Seed Sources, Experimental Insights on Challenges and Opportunities, presented by Matt Germino, will take place tomorrow. If you have more questions regarding this webinar or have requests for future webinars, please email or call me anytime. Thank you all for your participation today, and thank you so much, Stuart, for your presentation. All right, thanks. All right, have a great day, everyone.